Uh, welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. Yeah, I gotta read this. But I'll give it back to you. I promise to. Thunder. Uh, tonight, uh, Peter Barrow yes. is going to give his insight based on his recent trips uh, uh, to South America, learning from South America, lessons from the cone. Uh, the College of Complexes uh, has uh, two rules. Uh, one is no personal attacks, oh. as you may well know, and the other is uh, one person at a time, but we say it our own special way, one fool at a time. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, get a flyer in the back before you leave, and uh, without further ado, we give you uh, speaker this evening, Peter Perro. Peter! 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 All right! Yeah. Another May Day is upon us, coming up, and that's one of the reasons the Dill Pickle Club was formed over 50 years ago. Come out to Newberry in July, is it, Charlie? For yeah, it's on the schedule, July 29th, last weekend of July. Yeah, for the we have a table there. For the book sale, and lots of spring uh, frolics to roll back. Roger and Mr. Trump and keep keep them off balance. Uh huh. I uh, used 2016 to see uh, what conditions were like in South America. I have been to Brazil and I have been to Argentina before, but that was 1999, and I decided, well. Uh, 18 late years later, 15 years later, what's going on in Argentina? What's going on in the cone, as they call it, which is that funnel from Tierra del Fuego, I guess, from from Antarctica up the bo both coasts, Atlantic, Pacific, and forms a kind of cone up to the Amazon River area. Uh, it's like a big ice cream cone on a geographic map. So it's sometimes called the cone. Uh, and uh, spent some weeks touring. Reminds me of that guy Stanfield Smith. Every time he comes, he's from some remote place like North Korea uh, with a, a group of people who eat together, sleep together. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, communal dormitories. And he goes to Bolivia. And I thought, why can't I do that? But it wasn't as rough. And I went on, well, on my own, but my wife was with me. So I guess it wasn't like Stanfield's uh, communards that he visits. But um, it's, an, it's a romantic, I spent most of the time in Buenos Aires. It's a romantic kind of Paris of Latin America with these wonderful buildings and an obelisk something like the DC mall, but uh, very much more romantic, song, dance, tango, a uh, wonderful place. Hey, I hope I don't have trouble with this. It's supposed to be another building. What happened? Go back. Now what do we? One day is not full of time. Yeah. But that wasn't supposed to happen yet. We were supposed to get that other building. And uh, I think I was on the wrong button for you. Where's my... We were supposed to get that... I was supposed to go back to the second building and now we're into the ethnic group. You're saying, where's the top button? Mm -hmm. Oh, there. No, not the top button. It's the side button. The side button took me Forward and backwards. Oh, oh. Forward is there. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's make sure. <laughs> oh, we didn't do the full view. The full view is to get the center field that Very nice. Yeah. 
that's it. All right, and the four and the top will go forward. That's all I want to do. Not the top, the side. Oh, you're doing right. Left side goes back. Right. right side goes forward. All right, the boulevards, the cafes, the eateries are really quite fantastic. This is a style from Europe called Jugendstil. Uh, a style they picked up from Vienna. And remember, next to America, I think Argentina is one of the most multicultural societies in the world. Canada is catching up uh, with their Chinese population, but at the turn of the century and up through World War II, so many groups tried to, uh, of course, immigrate. And Argentina's doors were open to political refugees and people who wanted work. Uh, they really praised their literary figures. This is uh, Jose Luis Borges, one of their uh, favorite sons of Buenos Aires, a novelist. This is about Federico Garcia Lorca. To see these plaques on a building instead of generals or big businessmen, to me was wonderful to see. A little bit of his poetry he wrote from that hotel about his love for Argentina. Ah, that's the elevator. Yeah, the beautiful open shaft elevators. Uh, we had two, I think, here in Chicago. Uh, one was at the Fine Arts Building. If you still go down there, they crank you up, take you to the top. Still need an attendant. And another is at the Brewster uh, Hotel in Lincoln Park, where you need to be careful you don't fall down the shaft. <laughs> but uh, a lot of fine workmanship in these buildings, one after another, like old Paris. Uh, when you think of Argentina, you think of the tango. And I'll be showing you some clips of the tango and what the gestures mean. Uh, Carlos Gardel was a troubadour of tango and theater, sort of a Tony Bennett of his time, but, but a very romantic 1930s figure. And then when you think of Argentina, you think of gauchos. Gauch. You think of uh, these cowboys or early cowboys. Uh, uh, this one was deteriorating, you know, living on a horse, living together uh, on, on the pampa. Uh, grilling meat and sleeping on the prairie with the horse. I shouldn't say prairie, that's French. Fr uh, uh, something else I found though was that there was a Swiss colony in the center of Argentina from the 1860s and they still maintain their uh, heritage. This is, uh, well he's smoking his pipe and growing something on the land, but in 1941 they decided to commemorate that. Still today, they have their Swiss festival. Another immigrant group that came for work or to bring their skills to build Argentina. And they escaped, war crime. And escaped uh, many Jewish uh, refugees. Uh, still keeping their beer recipes alive. Uh, and I found a Czech beer there. And I thought, oh my god, Pilsen eight miles from my home and Pilsen's here. Well, it was the beer. Uh, all from these immigrants. It's moving a little faster than I'd like, but that's as close as we can get. Uh, and as long as we're into habits, from beer to something called, is this a free frame? Can I, can I pause? No. I cannot no. pause. I cannot pause. Well, then. Uh, is mate, yerba mate. Mate is tea, tea you know. And yeah. we have veterans here. We have Frank and we have Margaret Aguilar. And Frank, of course, was raised in Argentina and he knows about the politics and engineering in his home country. So he can help me a little bit. But uh, looks like, uh, come on, Peter. Yeah. The right button goes forward. 
Yeah, I was trying to get a pause on that. Tell us about Mate. Tell us like about the Mate. Mate looks a little bit like marijuana. And it has that green, uh, it has that green uh, flake to it. And you take it out and you pour that boiling water from the thermos into the thing. And uh, it really goes back to, I think, Mapucho Indians, that they would carve these gourds, these squash gourds, decorate them, put them on the table, put in the uh, yerba, and pour boiling water over it, and just walk around all day enjoying this. Uh, I saw people in a movie house, instead of popcorn or soda, they were sucking on the, the mate, and it's supposed to have Curing calming powers. Uh, not coffee, and I don't mean getting high, but I mean a curing herbal benefit to the mate. So I had to try it. Bitter as hell. And my wife was taking uh, a lot of uh, sugar with hers. Hey, now come out of my freeze frame again. Come you gotta maximize it again. I gotta max? Oh, click yeah. the button. Thank you. Well, that's one way to get a pause. So, she took plenty of uh, sugar with hers, uh, gringo style. But I'll, I'll pass this thing around and, you know, it's really a, a popular thing to do. Like you might have uh, coffee here at uh, Starbucks or your coffee at noon. And so, then when the boyfriend comes to visit the girl at her home, Oh. They grab this thing, and without telling anybody, let me let me show. They grab this thing they and put frozen. this under the they gas flame, so it make it real hot. And then they give it to him, and when he put it in, he he, he screams oh, bloody murder because he get burnt. That means the, the family goes, didn't even approve out. of the boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> All right. Why, why the well, that's what you will do here in the United States. I mean, you don't have the delicacy of, uh, you know, the, the art of... Then you just click on the circle and start over. See, it's... Uh, yeah, well, it's a Catholic country, although they don't make a big deal about Christmas, there were no decorations or lights or Santa Claus, but anyway, sort of a mock on all this publicity with Papa was this, uh, what can I call Push the top button if you want to stop it. The center target. The top one. All right. These were bubble heads of Francisco. <laughs> and... Uh, in the all right. In the tradition of the college, we have lots of atheists in the room. But uh, someone else played a trick on Papa. You got to maximize it again. By come on, come on, my little by putting a click. Yeah, by putting. Putting call girl uh, slips on the Papa Francisco poster. Uh -oh. And I thought, well, to each his own. And they had phone numbers, want a good time, call, so and so. Uh, I want to stop and say something about an important era, 1932 to 1950s. For 20 years was the age of Peronism. <laughs> and uh, Juan Perón, a very powerful political figure, meets Eva Perón in a theater, and he was impressed with her performance. They fell in love. You know the rest of the story. He became, she became a kind of Hillary to uh, Juan Perón, and uh, had a talent for reaching out to working people who she called the uh, uh, camisa. Uh, sons camisados, the shirtless ones, the working class, the down and out poor laborers. And uh, 
also had a female following because up to that time uh, men ruled government. So she became a minister, a minister of uh, health. She became a minister of social development and became a woman of the people and was praised as a kind of, well, you've seen the Evita movie by uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber with Madonna. I kept my promise. I kept my, they say she didn't really say that from the balcony, but it's a legend, a folk legend, a story. And uh, she was of poor lower class, uh, hard scrabble family, and she went a long way in, in her popularity with the uh, shirtless ones and for the poor families of Argentina. Uh, let me go. <coughs> so this covers half the building of her making speeches in the square. That was common. She, she gave better speeches than her husband, Juan Perón. <laughs> Uh, here's this idea of the shirtless ones who followed her, uh, the working poor, uh, the uh, metal workers in struggle, La Lucha. I happen to catch a public school. Yeah, I happen to catch a public school, was able to walk in a little bit, look at the elementary school classes, the stucco buildings. Well, today, she is still worshipped uh, pilgrimages to her tomb. And it was a little bit down a secret lane because they don't want people, oh, there were rumors about taking, the, uh, taking her body and uh, creating a whole myth or legend that she resurrected. I mean, this is really a charismatic woman. Uh, there's also uh, evidence of Communist Party, El Partido uh, Comunista, still alive. And I think this goes back to the populism that Eva and uh, Juan Perón began in the 30s, uh, during a depression era where it was uh, important to support the working class. Uh, let's see what we can get here, if it will, no. I got a manual player and I'm holding an auto player, so bear with me. There was a CCP cafe. God, I've never seen one of those in Chicago. We've got... Communists, too. Yeah, CCP yeah. Cafe. Go fund me. Uh, Everybody, go fund me. Go fund me. <laughs> uh, abortion. Legal, safe, and free. Believe it or not, in these times, there are parties in the Congress that want to turn things back, as our Republican Congress does, on public funding of abortion. And in Argentina, the women are saying, basta, no, don't do it. So instead of spray painting political slogans, somebody comes with a nice stencil, and they must have a lot of time. They pin it up, and they put paint over the stencil, and then they go down to another building and put paint over the stencil. Uh, it's a very methodical, that graffiti. It's no. Uh, thing on the side of a railroad car. And these were on hotels. You know, they got a lot of time to fool around and do this. Uh, lots of political slogans. Ah, about, Frank was talking to me about the desaparecidos. In the 1970s, under the rule of the generals, if you were a dissident, if you were a Marxist college student, if you organized rallies, you could be picked up in your home, you could be picked up at a rally and never seen again. These are the 70s now. This is that Nixon era, uh, you know, aid, aid, aiding the situation, no doubt, in Argentina. Young men and women were dropped from airplanes in the country, just pushed out of airplanes. Uh, you disappeared, and your parents never saw you again, Frank. Uh, you uh, probably no, you have to add that when the people were dropped from the planes into the sea, there was a priest in there that was the one to give the last kick, the last extrema, the last rites, and then kick. Yeah. 
So the church participated uh, intensely in the killing of the young people in there. Or you might say, I suppose, he wanted to give him last rites, but he could have bargained and said, what the hell are you doing to my people? And he didn't, so he goes they up. They went there to kick the him out in the play. Last uh, push. Yeah. Uh, so, aquí vivió Miguel Pancho Scaraparo, militant popular detainee who disappeared by the terrorism of the state, 1976. They're bringing these spots back. The new liberal government in the barrios, the municipal government, is saying, yeah, you can put this on the sidewalks. We know they're never coming home again. We know that was the last place they were seen in the 70s. And they're putting these things in the ground, in the barrios. And you can see women who were never returned or never came home. And you can see two, two men who went out that night to a rally and never came back again. And they're putting that in mosaic on the streets. A little bit like our Haymarket uh, monument uh, on uh, Randolph Street. So, uh, gee, I don't know if that's well. Okay, I'm getting to current politics. I'm getting to current politics under Nestor. Uh, Nesta Kirchner brought some reforms in the 80s to the government. One of the reforms was to try to collect the taxes. If you know about hyperinflation in Argentina, and things got so bad that you wanted to be paid every week, because the following week, hyperinflation would be so high, you would make less money. Uh, the destabilization of the is it peso or dollar? Peso, peso. Peso was a horrible thing. Uh, Nestor tried some reforms, and later on his wife, after Nestor ran a couple of terms, tried to succeed him, but it was not a very successful term for her, sort of a Hillary situation for her. <laughs> and for many other women in South America, the Chilean, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bachelot, Bachelor was accused of things and couldn't uh, run again. Uh, there's it's been some pretty horrible experiences for some of the women who have tried to be like Eva and been crushed down, put down. Uh, let me go to this uh, idea of, for example, under Kirshner, that the state should run the casinos and own them. Not Trump Majestic or Trump Tower, but the state should regulate and profit by, if you've got to have casinos and slots, the state will run and run it fairly, uh, not put it in the hands of private. Uh, so he tried things like that. Uh, I want to talk about opinions on tariffs, because we hear a lot of prattle right now from Trump about suddenly he's going to tariff the Chinese. He's going to tariff the Chinese for uh, no. Yeah, this is a sad story. We'll get back to that. Um, the idea here is the idea here is um, uh, let me get to go back there. I hope it later. It says, "Hold up your hands." This is a tariff. Not this is a robbery, but this is a tariff. Because when tariffs go up, consumer goods go up. The price for you and me of something that is highly tariff uh, can become expensive. But at the same time, we protect our domestic labor. Uh, so that was the idea of hands up, it's a tariff. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about this today. Should we tariff? Should we tariff? Um, floods of goods or dumping duties into the U.S. now. And Trump's making a big populist speech about that idea of protecting the American worker. Um, and our friend, sorry, we'll get to this dramatic pause. But our friend in uh, 
uh, College of Complex in Dallas said, I'm all for tariffs as long as Trump will tariff back the multinational American companies, uh, Philip Morris, uh, the one in Minnesota that makes pacemakers, uh, Medtronics. They pulled out their corporate headquarters in Minnesota and set up shop in Ireland. Well, his point was, if Jesus, if you are going to tariff uh, France, China, Korea, why not tax Philip Morris when they try to sell things back here? So it's a sort of get even situation that he has there at the College of Complex in Dallas. And I've never heard the Trump people say, well, if it's our company exporting things from Europe, and we give them a buy. Well, no, if you're going to set up shop in China, or well, most of uh, Mac, Apple computers are made in China, then when you try to sell them back here, you will be tariffed too, because you left your home corporation. And I'm thinking about Caterpillar coming up pretty soon. They'll extort us and leave, and on and on. You know those stories. I looked at a Ford to buy the other day. I thought, gee, maybe I, you know, I really should buy a Ford or a Chevy. And the stamp on the window said 40% of this automobile is made in Mexico. So I thought, how can I win? I buy an American car, but 40% of it is going back to Mexico. So how can I win? These parts are so outsourced today, you can't tell which is a foreign-made good and which is an American-made good, except commodities, corn, wheat. Pork. All right. They do a hell of a job, and I'm going to give them credit for these warnings on the packs of cigarettes. And they don't just say, oh, the Surgeon General warns you it may call, cause heart disease or complicate a pregnancy. They say, if you smoke, your baby may be sick, mother. Or if you bring that baby in that room, the smoke can do harm to your child. It's not can do, it would. Would. The way in there it says that would make you Thank you sick. with the Espanol. It will make your child sick. Another warning. They're not fooling around. And let's give some credit to the national government for saying, if you smoke, you will lose years of your life. And there's a guy at a morgue on the pack on the box of camels. Blew me away at the duty-free shop when I saw that. Uh, here's another one. And this is Philip Morris, a big offender. Uh, can I freeze this? Jeez. All right. Lucky strike means fine tobacco, you know, R.J. Reynolds. The smoke of this tobacco contains toxins. All right, that's half the carton. So you're going through duty free to give your relatives back home. Uh, here's some cigars and they see someone with an inhalator on. It sort of gives the message that this is crap and this is an American product and this is big money. R.J. Reynolds, you know, American tobacco company. This one's a, a real hood. This one's a real hoot because um, it's got, uh, I gotta go back, I gotta go back. It's, it's um, uh, what did you say back there? You can use the controller, it's on full screen. Oh yeah, okay. But I'd like to frame it before I stop. Smoking will reduce your sexual potency. And then we got the little crawling guy with the cigarette between his legs. So, I think they do a hell of a job uh, uh, detaining or uh, dissuading cigarette smoking. They had one pack guy I didn't capture, but it had a guy with cancer of the tongue, and it was all full of pus, and, and it was on the pack of cigarettes. And it had fester, and it was a oh, horrible thing. Uh, Another big, another big uh, item that's under tariff control is keeping 
Asian shoes out of the Argentine industry. This is protective. This means that Argentinians can still make and profit on an important leather goods industry. And they're afraid uh, with a flood of Chinese made shoes, it's all over for the domestic leather industry in Argentina. Uh, they got the homeless problem like, like we do, but I've never quite seen homeless under the a Kennedy roll out a mattress of their own or bring it over for the night. And these guys were trying to huddle and keep warm in front of a department store. Yeah, it's a mattress. It's a single mattress they brought out. And I had another creative solution for these guys. Uh, this one, he brought his girlfriend. Oh, jeez. He brought his girlfriend. And uh, they were sleeping. They weren't uh, in the act. They were sleeping. And the museum wasn't open yet. So there they were. They brought their mattress. This guy looked half in the grave. Uh, there was a wooden trough there. And he decided to put his blanket a couple of feet back. But, you know, if he had frostbite or hepatitis that night, they may as well just roll him in the box. <laughs> so, you know, we, have, we had a very fine show here called The uh, Homeless Camps of Chicago. Wasn't that terrific? Uh, they have tolerance, more tolerance there for homeless? Uh, you can say the church is helping, but I, I, in my view, the municipal government is the only true force that can allocate money to the problem and build dormitories. But it was mainly men out, some families out, sleeping on the street, and a more temperate climate, so it was a little easier to take. Uh, then we decided to jump over the Rio Plata and look at Uruguay. And I love this. Uh, Homeland Security, I could never say, would put up. Um, Minister of the Interiors, we are close to the people. I thought it was a touching thing to say. We are close to the people, and you got free tourist information. So, so, okay, I went in for the tourist information. They are close to the people, after all, and I got a visa, so... Boy, this is... And I got a... There, full set. Hey, come on. Uh, these chairs. These chairs were um, kind of a nice idea because instead of a line with people behind you saying, what are you doing, listening to where you're going, the chair creates a kind of a wall for the people waiting in line. So your conversation is private. I think they ought to do that at banks in Chicago. To heck with these auto teller lines. We ought to have this kind of thing, and then we'd have some privacy for a moment, and we'd step away. Frank Lloyd Wright did that with chairs in some of his homes. All right, what do we got next? What, who's up? Who's up? So we get to Uruguay. Oh, La Casa Rosa. Sorry. This is the pink house. Not the blue house like in Seoul, Korea. Not the white house like in Washington <laughs> or Trump Tower in New York. But the uh, government operates from the pink house. Geez, I didn't know if you needed this mic. Am I, uh, am I needing this thing? Yeah, yeah. I do? Yeah. I do. Oh, gee. Uh, Eva was supposed to have spoken there uh, in the play by Andrew Lloyd Webber. She was supposed to have spoken from this balcony, and thousands were in the square in front of the Casa Rosa. So we had to get that picture. Uh, so now we should be headed to Uruguay. Yeah, sure. Great. Their license plate, our product. A Chevy. Chevy Spark. I don't believe Argentina makes its own automobiles, 
so they fabricate U.S. automobiles, Peugeot's, French, and Volkswagen. Ford. And Ford's. Right now we're looking better than Volkswagen these days because Volkswagen was indicted, you know, and they took, took the perp walk last summer for knowing about their uh, improper materials and uh, dangerous cars. Volkswagen, yeah, they were indicted. It was they were environmental. They, they were handcuffed. They didn't put the environmental right emissions. Yeah. Emissions, yeah. yes, that's all. That's still yeah. dangerous. It's still against EPA, and they were carried off in handcuffs uh, and uh, extradited. So it's serious business. Okay, we're in Uruguay, and uh, okay, I, you know, they, they they're more relaxed people, and and. 40% of Argentina lives in Buenos Aires. So you can imagine the crowding and the uh, the subway or the subte as it's called. But you get the Uruguay, people are a lot more friendly, uh, more livestock, more agriculture. And right away I relaxed a bit more. So this was called the Museum of Humor. And I thought, oh, I'll you know, pay a few pesos. And found this funky uh, Dadist kind of assembly, assemblages, where you're eating a meal, the artist ate a meal in his car. I don't know what to say of it. It's, it's like uh, Klaus Oldenburg down at the Art Institute of Chicago when he was in school here. It sat that table and there was in a 1948 automobile. And that was the Museum of Humor. But Take a look at their international attitude toward humor. It's not just Cantin Flas or Carlos Gardel. They mix <coughs> many, many people you'll see from around the world, France, Europe, and the US, who have the talent of humor. Uh, right? Mel Brooks. Monty Python, the Marx Brothers. Los Monty Pythons. I don't know all of them, but I guess Bob Hope was called Leslie Towns. Was that Leslie? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Marx Brothers. So this was a rare, rare museum. I have never seen a comedy museum in the U.S. <laughs> what are they doing about the environment? Uh, they're making smart cars, and these cars can seat four people, four adults. They can go up to 40 miles per hour, all on power cells. Electric. All on batteries. And I believe that's a car the Argentinians make themselves. So to hell with the uh, Mercedes and the Jags. That's a great practical car for Uruguay or uh, Buenos Aires to, man to uh, manage around town. Yeah. Hey, I haven't seen this for 30 years. They still pump your gas in Argentina. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm working my way through college. He said, I don't ask for tips, but this is my salary job. He puts on a plastic glove and he pumps, you know what, shell gas with shell. <coughs> and he was pumping the gas uh, for the patron, and uh, so was his uh, compañero pumping the gas. Stretched that hose about as far as he could. Because they still yeah. Do they have an oil company here, Uruguay, or no South American oil company? Oh, what's the big? Yacimiento petrolífero fiscales. Thank you. Say it again. Yacimientos Petrolíferos Fiscales. That's from Argentina. Fiscales. Yeah. Petróleo Fiscales. I didn't see a lot of signs for it, but Shell and Amoco were certainly dominant. Shell oil, I guess, is British or British American run. Dutch. Dutch, Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, what's the one that Hugo Chavez used to pump? There was a, they were here. Sitco. Sitco, yeah. If you're loyal to the movement, you buy Sitco gas. Oh, question? Yes, Yeah. Do they do like Brazil does? Big on the, uh, 
Alcohol fuels? Ethanol. Uh, Brazil is big on ethanol because they cut cana, they cut a sugar cane. Right, did they do a lot there? Not, not in Uruguay, not, not in Uruguay, but makes sense in the Pampas of Argentina. That's a good question. I have to <coughs> Google that one. If you could put 15, 20% ethanol in the tank, you'd be saving, you'd be making work for peasants and you'd be saving, uh, it's the whole thing yeah, is a scale. Yeah, it's almost pure ethanol. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah, here? No, Brazil. Oh, Brazil. Pure, almost pure sugar cane. Yeah, but the whole thing yeah, on the sugar cane, yeah. the ethanol, is a scam. You use more energy than you get. <laughs> oh, processing the ethanol, I've heard, yeah. takes a lot of energy to process yeah. downstate corn. So who's the winner? I know. I hear they get a lot better results from the sugar cane. Yeah, I bet. It's a scam. I bet the uh, compul uh, carburetor uh, works better off the uh, corn than off the cane. Um, you know, um, Charlie's talked a lot about how to keep Amtrak alive. And I get his emails. It's important. Uh, when I got to the bus station, I know it's a little rustic. Uh, they had a fireplace for cold months. But all these uh, merchants were bringing in uh, boxes of merchandise and, and uh, cable and just dropping it there. And the clerks knew what to do with it. And they packed it and gave them a receipt. That cross-country bus, the likes of Greyhound here, simply puts the freight under the bus with your suitcases and makes the drop at the next city. Amtrak could be doing such a thing if they put an extra car on and make revenue that Congress wants them to make. But there are rules I understand that says no, Amtrak cannot handle freight, only passengers. Well, why the hell not put an extra car on and beat Fed Express? or non-union UPS at their, I'm sorry, beat non-union Federal Express at their own game. UPS is union. Why not? He's going there anyway. Throw, throw, the, throw the merchandise at the we bottom. Could beat that union. Yeah, I they mean. They have in the past. What? beat that UPS union. Yeah, that UPS yeah, union on Canal. Close that down. Yeah. yeah, they need a big, they think they need a big, wonderful truck to deliver a little package from think, Amazon. Peter, don't you think railroads know about Railway Express? Oh, I don't even know about Railway Express. What is it? It's the package delivery system oh. that covered the entire nation. Oh, oh, well, when did we, we stop with that? Oh, 1960. There it goes. 1960. So 50 years ago, we could have beat uh, it propped up Amtrak and uh, we got rid of yeah. yeah. packages. It didn't work. It's See? dead. And yeah. people put the stuff on and take it off. Yeah. And if people have to be at the station to pick it up. In in Uruguay, you, you have to be there at the station to pick it up at the next point. They're not going to bring it to your house. Yeah, the freight companies don't want Amtrak to do that. That oh, aren't good. Oh. <laughs> I love gadgets. I love gadgets, and I go into supermarkets, and I even go into public washrooms to see how they handle things. Because I think a mark of a quality society is how public facilities look and are run. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Don't you think? I mean. Yeah. We've got park district places on Lakeshore Drive that have been boarded up and you wouldn't go in there even if you could. But this was the, um, the public bath and they're still using gravity fed pressure. A great idea. I don't know why we did away with gravity fed toilets. But plumbing leaves a little to be desired because it's basically plastic hose. If you're in plumbing in, in Chicago, you know it would never pass code. You need copper, especially for hot water. But they're running plastic any way they want. They make bends and they just uh, uh, clamp it to the tub. 
or under the sink, and it comes out somewhere on the back lawn. It was very amazing to me that they could do all these wonders with plumbing. Uh, I also found a chair fabricator, an artisan, who made this clever chair, and he said, uh, you could buy one of these for 40 bucks, he said, but how the hell could you get it home in the airplane? And it felt really good and ergonomically comfortable, and I sat in it, and I was quite relaxed. And so he was making his living that way. How Off much you wanted for it? 40, 40, the equivalent of 40 US dollars. You could, you could check it on the plane. I don't, well, I could Does fold, fold it. up? I could fold it. I bet Ikea will get that plan before I... But that was plastic, right? No, wood! That's pine. Oh, it's pine. That's pine. No plastic, plastic shit. Check it for $25 extra. <laughs> yeah, I was, away. I was thinking, no yeah. plastic shit around yeah. here. It's a good design. It's, it's a great design, design, isn't it? This is an Uruguay, right? It folds up. Now, this is an Uruguay. And they, they live more off the land in Uruguay, and they're concerned about depleting the land in Uruguay. Uh, ecotourism, but a uh, beautiful place. So we're back to Buenos Aires. A <laughs> wonderful, a wonderful uh, Art Nouveau building, just clad with Burger King, Burger King Yum Brands. Yum Brands yes, owns yes. stuff. Pizza Hut, Burger King. McDonald's. KFC. No, McDonald's is independent, but KFC, yeah, they got all those chicken Pizza checks. Hut. Pizza Hut. Yum brands. Taco Bell. They're there. It's colonial. Ah, uh, but Argentinians are fighting back with very good wine. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. great wine. Mm -hmm. With that Mediterranean sea side that grows a nice grape. So for the cost of Gatorade there, you could buy a liter of very fine wine. That was one thing that was very low cost. Uh, uh, but everything else, I looked at shirts for $30, sport shirts for $30, shoes for $60, and I thought, how can the locals making three fifty an hour afford these clothes? I, I, and I was not at a, at a high-end department store, I was at a kind of a target place, uh, small, small, it wasn't a, wasn't a, a chain store. I couldn't buy clothes. I couldn't afford leather goods. I couldn't, uh, the dinners were a little high too. But anyway, here we come with another product, Purina Dog Chow. Not only is the product ours, but we put English on it anyway, you know. And, you know, sort of this language colonialism. But anyway, Dog Chow for your cachorro and make him healthy. And we're doing that with so many things, but but in the end, but in the end, well, we got British whiskey, we got uh, Argentine wine, and we got a Havana cookie made in Argentina, isn't it? Yeah. It's a sweet treat for kids, I heard. Those are really good. Really good. It's a chocolate sandwich bar. So this is the world of marketing, and these things are, are constantly competing back and forth. Uh, Argentine raw materials, pretty much, and Western finished goods and technology right back to the Argentines. And it's sort of a trade war, it's who could make the highest percentage of the most exports. And if you need a laptop, we win. If you need uh, Alfaro cookies, for Christmas time, they win. Uh, so, they've got to develop a more diverse economy to win the game in today's global society. I'm afraid they can't do it quite fast enough. The same with Brazil. All one crop economies, your tobacco, sugar cane, they've got to bust out of that and do more <coughs> with industry and technology. So, I'll stop with that slide. Uh, before. Okay. Uh, if you were traveling from Buenos Aires to Mar del Plata for your vacation, yeah. the bus will advertise the places that they will stop in the way for you to have breakfast or to have lunch. Nice and bus. they 
give you the Alpha Horus as an encouragement for you to take that bus. Or you go to that town, you say, get that on that stop, they, they serve you Alpha Horus Havana or Medias Lunas, uh, whatever, you know, and, and that's how they advertise and you should take one bus or the other. That's a border stop. That's a border stuff, yeah. I mean, what we got here beating the heck out of Greyhound is that uh, super bus that goes in, uh, into Ann Arbor. Megabus. 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 I'm not American at all. We were asleep at the transportation shift again, and they came from England and beat the pants off us with good express service within the Midwest region. They're not trying to go coast to coast. They saw an opening and they beat us on regional buses. They cut Greyhound's price in half. So the United Kingdom saw an opportunity, came in here and knocked the hell out of Greyhound. They do it too. You know, we're all in this global war of underselling, underpricing, uh, cutting labor costs. So that was good for me. When I travel, I don't go to beaches. When I travel to these countries, I go into bathrooms and I go and look at plumbing and I want to see uh, public schools and walk into uh, playgrounds and uh, see things like who's pumping the gas and what does the gas cost per liter. It's always more than we pay. Always more than we pay. Mm, really? Oh, geez. Seven dollars for a liter in Korea. I couldn't believe it. Wow. A liter. U.S. seven. I couldn't believe it. So I, I, I just like to take the temperatures of these countries and say, are we doing better or are we doing worse than that? How are their hospitals? How are their clinics? Do they pay for private schools or is a public school? In Argentina, I think half the schools are private charter, Catholic. So you know, that says a lot about the quality of life to me and that's why I go on these journeys. My wife sometimes goes alone. She went to India alone, she went to Istanbul alone for conferences. Yeah, I just Senorita. wanted to make a comment. I think it's interesting what you say about the economy and what you can learn comparing and yeah. observing. And, you got to get out. But I, there's a, I love documentaries, and a good one I recently saw was Poverty, Inc. Or, it's about Haiti, and it showed how the biggest problem with Haiti is that all these USAID and various charities will dump, um, like they dump solar windows on a, they were doing great selling solar windows until we started handing them out for free. So, you know, oh. our trade policy ends up hurting these poor local economies. Oh, yeah. You know, and we really ought to almost have a UN for trade and make it fair. And, oh. You know, keep it a level playing field. Yeah, so you're yeah. not just So really we wrecked hurting. an industry by giving away the solar panels. Yeah, yeah, we'll just dump things on uh, them. You know, um, and so it's this unintended negative consequences yeah, that we're not good that aware of. Intention, but blown. Yeah, uh, it's but good. bullshit unintended. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah. uh, we do everything with a second purpose. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Well, we got to be regulated. The you know. US Department of Agriculture has <laughs> surplus of cheese. You know, you get this Velveeta stuff. We can't store enough of it. And grains, and, and so we ship that stuff out. It's not always the best of food. Illinois is a big uh, exporter of those things. Conagra, uh, the other one wants to move. Uh, the other big egg company wants to, threatens to move out if they can't extort Governor Rauner. Uh, Mc, Mc something, uh, anyway, it's a conglomerate. National Foods or something. Yep. It's a conglomerate. Hey, the Archer Daniel, Archer Daniel Midland. Midland. Bushels and bushels of patented seed. They think they own the formula to the seed. Okay. And if it blows over on a farmer's land and they see their seed growing on his farm, they can file a lawsuit that they're copying uh, a genetic seed model that the patent. I mean, this is sickness. We give it away when we feel we want to look good, and then we hoard it when we want to hoard it. Well, I read 
Yeah, there's a movie about that where the genetically modified seeds. That's what it's is, called. They. Yep. It ends up that that killed the trade. It used to be local indigenous farmers would recycle their own seeds, and they were really better for oh. the economy. Or, oh. I mean, they would manage the bugs in a kind of natural way. But these genetically modified ones are made to distribute fertilizer, and it, it basically uh, it kind of captures the market for this. I don't see. Monsanto. And Monsanto, that's the other way. I don't see how a young family can go into farming anymore downstate Illinois and make a living. Well, this is like in South America, too, as where we're destroying the, the oh, local oh. indigenous markets oh, oh. with our... Well, this is the time Charlie would say, it's a question. Give him questions. But if there are no questions, not Charlie would say, I mean... Uh, um, Tim Bolger would say... Was that a question? Yeah. Well, that's right. a question. So that one's Jonathan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if there are no other questions. <laughs> well, we never went to the question period. Deal pickle club. Is this a question? Well, period? we saved time. We saved the whole thirty seconds, but just saved time. Time. <laughs> going to it. Yeah. All about saving time. Yeah. Yeah. Time efficiency. You're a great MC. Um, Doug, yeah, Doug Pinkley has yeah. questions. When you were down there, was that when, was that after Trump was elected? Did you get oh, any? Uh, no. you, you were this was before Trump was in there. Uh, he was campaigning, but it was uh, January, so people had still written him off at that point as not a viable candidate. So you don't know what their attitude is to the U.S. now? Uh, last January, I mean January 16th, he was a glint in the eye of some big banker, but. He wasn't seriously taken seriously then. It was still Obama's White House. What is their attitude so, towards America? Do 2016. They, was November. Do they dislike Obama? Do they uh, dislike Americans or American uh, policy? See, that's it's tough. You know, under Perón, it was state control of business, and if state controls the business. Foreign globalism will not buy that business. But you will pay a higher price at home for the consumer goods, is the Friedman theory, that if you just capture an industry, then there won't be competitiveness and the consumer will suffer. So Milton Friedman and the boys from UC were down working on Argentina, you can bet and restructuring that government from generals that couldn't run a tractor to a new kind of neocon organization uh, that could, or was, that were open to free markets and foreign capital. And it was the Chicago boys that cracked open Argentina and said, you know, be like us. Free market forces solve everything. You're suffering from hyperinflation here. Your dollar's worth nothing or shrinking to nothing. Put value in it by selling some of your legacy here. You got lumber, you got the pampas, you got wheat, you got cattle. Uh, you know, get into the global market. And the uh, Friedman and the Chicago school boys sort of won that argument under Nixon's uh, protection. And uh, slowly, after after that, we had uh, Bush one and Bush two. So it's free free market stability or managed markets. Nestor likes to say. Kirshner called it managed market, not free to help do what you want here with our pro our resources. Is, is this NAFTA? Would, would NAFTA affect oh. these markets? No. Jeez. Yeah. yeah, I'm really against NAFTA, and um, we've got a situation here where, I'm sorry, strange bedfellows, but uh, Bush Jr. started NAFTA, and Obama made sure it was all wrapped up in the first year of Obama's administration. Started by Clinton. Clinton. I'm sorry, Clinton. Clinton started it. Bush Sr. went all the way back to Coca-Cola diplomacy, but... Clinton got behind it in a big way. It's going to help bring prices down for the consumer, but it's going to put us out of work. No, he forgot about that. 
and Obama sort of tied the package together. Now Mr. Trump's saying, I'm not supporting NAFTA, we're going to decertify that. I'm not supporting the Pacific Trade Agreement with the Pacific Rim yeah. countries and the Canada pipeline. I'm thinking, what's he cooking? What is he going to build a, a, a Trump pact or what? What's the madman theory? I, I, I just don't. I like his idea to shut down NAFTA, but I don't know what's up his sleeve because he's a free market guy. I think he wants partners he can control in the deal. Yeah. Absolutely. And his Brexit was good news, I think, for Trump. Way to go. Bust out of the deal because not, they're not all your favorite partners and you're not getting the best cut on these pacts. And I'm going to see what he will do in the next couple of years. What kind of pact will he put together? I think they've just taken deregulation too far. They just, Milton Friedman thought it was a good idea. Good idea. And take it over, you know. And, but it, it would be better if they had more regulated. I guess, I'm not sure about TPP. You, you think yeah, Trans-Pacific. Would that have been good? I Probably not. If we made it up, it's I probably don't, bad. Yeah, <laughs> if we had something to do with it, it was probably to our advantage. Uh, Alaska's in that part, uh, Japan's in that rim, Taiwan, I don't think mainland China's in the TPP. They're too big a player and too much of a threat. Oh. Chile is in that. They're on the Pacific Rim. Uh, so TPP is gone now. Trump put the brakes on it. And he said, I promised American workers I would do this for them, and restore their jobs. Uh, the euro is in a hell of a mess, too, because, I mean, the, the EC is another pact that failed. I don't know, couldn't, couldn't keep reactionaries away, from, get their hands off it from messing with it. They didn't like the globalism or the internationalism. And now we got Greece crippled, and we've got Italy crippled, and Spain is limping. Right. That World Bank, I think, imposed yeah. some bad deals on that. The it's, World Bank. Who loans the poor members the funds to get in the pact? It's the uh, banks. It's Deutsche Bank. It's Bank of America. It's a war on those poor little people. The they funded the pact. Do you have any suggestions how we should... Uh, intervene there? Oh God, don't say that word. Uh, uh, intervene intervene to the neoliberalism, uh, liberalism is um, come to the card table, join the deal. You don't have a lot of capital, but you can trade in goods and resources and we'll capitalize and monetize it. Uh, they formed their own called Mercosur. Mercosur. It means the mercantile traders of South America. They formed their own pact saying, well, if North America is going to have a free trade pact, we better get out in the game and trade among ourselves. So is that the answer? My pact against your pact? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Why not? Market power. Okay, Friedman, I think, would go for that. Milton Friedman will go for that. So, you, oh yeah. yeah. I read somewhere, and I'm thinking about Milton Friedman. We always bought into it, but the whole idea of monetarism might be almost like a fascist idea. You know that I don't, I don't know, but it, I'm almost beginning to Margaret think. Margaret laughs. Right. Yeah. That's her, Margaret. Come on. No, it is a fascist idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just is a fascist idea. It is? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Whoever has the strongest currency uh, wins the trade pack. I mean, you've got the currency to move the market. And you call the shots. And it used to be the Deutsche Mark, and it used to be the uh, pound sterling, and guess now no, it's us. That can't last forever. That can't last forever. We'll have a round of inflation that will devalue our own dollar, and then the one, the Chinese one, will go up. Go ahead. Uh, can you talk about 
uh, the significance of Simon Bolivar? Yeah, you know. Simone. I mean, uh, he was a model figure, but when we have Stansfield Smith here, he knows his Marxist history, <laughs> his colonial uh, culprits, and he can talk about Evo uh, Morales, and he can talk about uh, uh, Chavez, Hugo Chavez, and Venezuela is devastated, and I think that's what the banks were hoping to see. Uh, that Sitco would fall, and uh, I think that uh, the uh, monetary fund is happy to see Yoga Chavez go, in my opinion. And of all people, to open, open Cuba, it was uh, Obama. I never expected a liberal Democrat to open Cuba. It's because he's not a liberal. What? I, I never expected an, a liberal Democrat. Why not? To open because mm -hmm. because Nixon busted open China. No no liberal Democrat could have done that. It would have been giving away the nation, giving caving in to the enemy. But Nixon knew what he was doing. Pepsi Cola came with him. Yeah. Yeah. What? Now this in the Venezuela, you've got a revolution breeding against Morales. Now, right Maduro, here. Maduro. Maduro. Yeah, bring us up to date Maduro. on that. Do you know? Uh, well, <laughs> it was just this weekend. Do you know? But I, from what I understand, I can't tell the people. It sounds like they're really trying to get Morales to step down, and I don't know if it's a, you know, a fascist propaganda, you know, war against him because Chavez picked him, right? And. Um, but it, it seems that people want, it's, a, it's like they've manufactured opposition, or maybe there's a genuine opposition to, to him. You know, I think but there's I, genuine pain. And when the voters step up, you know, that uh, what are they say, are you better off this year than you were last under him? There is uh, a lot of pain. You know, they're in, they're in food lines now, and, uh, the bank, the World Bank got what they wanted, and now they're in food lines, and no one has to interfere there. The people will reverse and say, I gotta eat, my kids gotta eat, no more chavistas, it's time for a moderate. And there's going to be a swing back to moderate. But we're going to, they're going to be trading again with U.S. and Canada and uh, to eat. So it was an experiment in socialism, but we don't count on tragedies and the pioneers to pass away like that. And the guy he appointed isn't any good. Wasn't it his friend? So, mm -hmm. well. Socialism can work in Costa Rica or right? Nowhere. It works nowhere in the world. Nowhere? It is nowhere in the world. Sweden. 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 Oh, no, 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 no. That's not socialism, man. Short horizon. That's not well, that's okay. it's, it's, managed it's, it's managed markets. It's managed markets. That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, all this, uh, I was just tracing back and thinking that Bush, too, got so involved with the Middle East that he kept his eye, his eye was off the ball in Latin America. And so Chavez, Hugo Chavez, was pretty unfettered. And then Obama had this idea of pivot to the pivot to the east was his big idea for second term. Pivot to the east, work with China, Korea, and Japan. Yeah. And he had his eye off the ball in Latin America. Meanwhile, progressive socialist governments are growing that under Reagan would have been rolled back. The Sandinistas, the Nicaraguas, uh, Nicaraguans. <coughs> would have been rolled back under his eye, under his watch. But because we're stretched so thin in the Middle East, we've had our eyes off Latin America. And it gave progressive company, uh, countries time to grow. Benign neglect. Yes. I saw a documentary that really was concerning. It implied that the United Nations, which I know is, is kind of got a corrupt development thing going. This was in Peru, where they are just 
really stripping it and occupying it and the guy controlling it is taking the money. And it, you know, we, we don't realize, we think United Nations is supposed to be a good thing. But, uh, I think the UN is the last hope for balanced world government that could stand up to the U.S. from time to time. And it's a concept that Trump absolutely hates. If he could pull every seat, if he could take that seat off the floor in the General Assembly or Security Council, I'm sure he would get us out of the United Nations. I mean, if he hates global trade pacts, he's bound to hate UN as last word over his policies. He wants America first and he wants unilateral action when he wants it, when he wants it. I think he's so. just a puppet of the neoliberal Milton Friedman types. Uh, you know, he's doing what they tell him to do. And, uh, I think he's bigger than them. I think he thinks he's bigger than them. And that he can do what he wants. They're all fascists. Charlie. So. I hate yeah, to end these, in a sad, depressed state here, but... Hey, Chuck, what these, happened to the rebuttal? These, uh... <laughs> well, yeah, line up your chair. I gotta go. <laughs> we're, uh... These countries were uh, discovered and settled before North America, yet it appears their standard of living is significantly lower. Yeah. Wow, come. <coughs> That's a big question. Because America's... Leadership. America's right now. <laughs> and they had European settlement. Yeah. Yes. Well, well the way I figured the figures you gave, the standard of living is about one fifth. If your dollar, if your figures are correct, have minimum wage. Yeah, yeah. The clerk at the hotel said I make three fifty an hour. They're talking about one fifth. At the hotel desk. That's significantly lower than the bar houses. I mean, the equivalent of the U.S. equivalent, three fifty, And the shirt cost 30 bucks when I went to the department store. She's got to buy the shirt there. She's got to buy the shoes there. How the hell do they do it? The bus was two bucks. I, I don't understand who's making the money, but it's a 1% there, too. Agribusiness. Agribusiness. Capitalism and fascism are different. American fascism is is a destructive force on the world. We, you know, we've got to control our own corporate control, you know, deal imposing. Well, we're back to Bernie again. It sounds like yeah, Bernie, exactly. Bernie, <laughs> Bernie, feel the burn. Well, if we don't want to line up the chairs, you can just have dessert and. Talk among yourselves. No, yeah. I want to think no, of no, 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 no. Oh, go for it. Don't change the format. Right. Thank you. Don't make no, 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 no dictator. Wait, did you have a question, ma'am? No, uh -oh. no, he's making a comment. Move from the question period. Let's <laughs> thank our speaker. Let's thank our speaker. We are now going to rebuttal. How many people want to How many people would like to give a rebuttal this evening? How many people want to give a rebuttal? Oh, I think it's done. Yeah. Raise, raise your hand, please, if you'd like to give a rebuttal this evening so we can decide how much time everybody has. That's at least five. Oh. Okay, five minutes. well, I, I would say five minutes, but we don't say five minutes. to be other people. Okay, we'll give you five minutes, a generous five minutes, because it looks like we have less than ten. We got ten. We got two. We got. Oh, where's my, where's my mate? My mate It's over here. I need a Over here. Oh, there we go. 9 to 45. Maybe she'll put some mate. Go, Frank. Go for it. Yeah, coming from uh, Argentina, a country that was uh, dominated by the British, uh, a long, long time, uh, we, we saw what is to be dominated and, and exploited and so on. But uh, I think I want to have more a global view hey, of thanks. what humanity is to the earth. I think that uh, we have been uh, 
distracted by all these different politics from different countries uh, competing with each other. But as a whole, we are a disease to the earth. We are cle uh, clearly, we are diminishing the, the power of life on the earth. We dump about 9,000 tons of plastic shit into the sea every day. Yeah. It's not every week or every month, it's every day. Yeah. I have the fortune when I was younger to be a scuba diver. I've been in all the seas in the world, Australia, South China Sea, uh, the Galapagos, wherever, wherever I went, what I saw was a plastic shit suffocating life everywhere. In the Galapagos, there were the big albatrosses, skeletons, all, all dried up with the plastic in their stomachs. So this is going on for a, for a long while. And so since we are such a destructive force into the life of the Earth, I think we should take a more encompassing uh, view of our politics when we discuss about the politics in this country or that country or the competition between countries and, and realize that as a whole we have not been able to collaborate it into a more sustainable uh, world economics. We are going to blow ourselves up for bullshit because it will not, we will not gain anything. If we blow ourselves up uh, the leftover uh, will be uh, a desolated land, uh, impossible to cultivate and, and impossible to, to, to extract the nutrition that we, <coughs> we need. We are too many people, and because of religious forces or, or blindness of the different countries, we keep growing, the population of the world keep growing. As we grow, we need more of the energy that the sun is depositing on the earth and, and, and making all the plants from which we survive. If we continue increasing the value of our, our population, then we will need more and more of those uh, uh, resources, and so we need to cultivate more intensively. Uh, and when you do that, you, you are subject to uh, periods of, of plenty and plenty, uh, periods of of, 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 of not having enough because it's, it's a natural flow of things. If you uh, one year have a good a good uh, uh, wheat uh, crop, the next year probably you will have a plague that, that uh, insects that will attack that and it will be in a famine situation. Now, we don't have the mental capacity to be uh, loving, giving, uh, compete, uh, uh, contributing to each other. We are an, an animal that is brutish, aggressive, and destructive. And until we recognize that, and we start moderating our, our aggressiveness and our destructive tendencies, uh, unless we recognize it, uh, we, we cannot control it. So um, that that's my my thought. When you see the when you see the consequences in China, uh, we took some lectures at the University of Chicago about the uh, rivers in China and the, the 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 destruction of the river system. It was so. This is 20 years ago. So it's not a new thing. So. The, 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 the smart people in China must have known because we knew it in a lecture of people who travel to China. So, uh, so far we have not shown the capacity of correct or, or change our, Five seconds our to go. destructive. Five seconds to go. Keep going. Okay, our destructive uh, tendencies. So we no. are all fuckers. Yes, yes, we are. Six, five seconds. So, uh, <laughs> Hello, boy. Hey, you fucker. He takes the title with pride. <laughs> All right, uh, I just wanted to add some cultural things. So when he was talking about communities, a fascinating community we found 
we traveled um, when we were on our Luna de Miel, which is our honeymoon, we went down to, um, from Buenos Aires, about a thousand miles. Now Argentina is a very long country, and, yeah. and so we traveled, we had to fly down to Trelew, T-R-E-L-E-W, which is not like a Spanish word, guys, and the port city of Trelew, which was actually fairly close to the coast, the port city was Rawson, R-A-W-S-O-N. And we're walking around and thinking, what, what is going on here? And we found a little museum that revealed, which I didn't know, but people do apparently, and they, and they call the group the Sub-Patagonian Welsh. So they're below oh. the Pampas. And in 1849, Welsh miners um, basically bought and repaired a wooden ship, sailed from Wales, because England at that time was imposing, they were forbidding the teaching of Welsh language and culture in the schools. And so the people emigrated to Argentina, and they still publish a Welsh newspaper in Welsh, and they still teach Welsh at a, at a Sunday school or Saturday school there. So they speak Spanish, and they have Casas de Te, which is a tea house, and you can get proper British tea there and um, scones and all kinds of things and it's really a very interesting place to go but they had this little museum that we went to as well as the first monument uh, constructed in South America to Columbus which was in the late 19th century and they didn't really like Columbus in the South in South America for whatever reason don't ask me. I can't imagine. Huh? I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> well, the indigenous sure as heck didn't like him. Okay, right. the second thing is um, uh, the, the uh, just kind of the, the um, inheritance or the, the heritage of Argentina per se. It's when we went, which was 30 years ago, 45% of the, of the people had Italian descent. Yeah. 40% were, were Spanish, and the rest were a total mix, and Germans, uh, including a lot of Nazis, and, um, and various fascists. In fact, it's still common to see swastikas in the buildings there. Um, and, um, and they bombed, of course, the Israeli Cultural Center several, a uh, couple, like 10 or 15 years ago, and killed a number of people there. Um, and there's a lot of anti-Semitism anti there uh, that's fueled by not only the Nazis, but also the Catholic Church, which is basically anti-Semitic. When we um, went there, uh, Cardinal Beltran said that uh, the government of um, Alphonsine, who was a, the first one who was elected after the um, General. The the uh, military uh, dictatorships were finally abolished in the early uh, 1980s. Yeah. Um, did re <laughs> you're just back to me, Peter. I'm sorry. Um, it, it refused to get rid the government of communists and Jews. So it was. It's not a very. Um, it's not a neutral government there. And mate is a really interesting thing because the the thing that they they have the gourd, they when we were there, I took pictures that the workers that they, they were doing street work, they were like the streets of sand here, and they had a little grill set up with a teapot as well as they grilled their meat on there for lunch, and they had the hot water and they made the mate for lunch. And so everybody had this like picnic dinner for, for lunch when they were uh, repairing the streets or whatever it was that they were doing. So it was really very interesting. Evita uh, was a fascinating woman. She obviously came up from the working class. She was the um, quote unquote illegitimate daughter of a, a person who was very wealthy in Buenos Aires and had his hacienda in the country, but his wife didn't want to come to him to the country because it was really very quote unquote primitive, even though he had a pretty luxurious hacienda. So he had a city family and he had a country family, but the country family was of course illegitimate. So she, uh, oh no, I have a lot of things to say. There's always oh, an after party. There's always an after party. <laughs> after party. Okay, so let's see, what do I really want to say? Well, there's a lot of things that I could add, but there you are. 
Um, I, I just want to, oh, the disappeared people is very important. The, the disappeared were 35,000 is the conservative estimate of people who disappeared <coughs> under the military dictatorship. Young people, students. And most of them were, were students, in fact. There are several movies that were made here, um, Burnt Oranges and whatever were made places. from Argentine, people who came here from Argentina and are now in academia or in the arts or whatever, and they made movies about the, the disappeared, and they're very poignant. Thank you. Okay. I have a lot more if anybody wants to talk to me. Thank you very much. Five minutes, otherwise I'll go if nobody else has got anything. Oh, then I can have a second time. Yeah, I'll have a second. Give her a second. You're going to have my second. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are, don't listen very good, I mean. Um, I'll blame us. I think uh, politicians uh, love to give uh, speeches about how they've got the ideas, and I think uh, it only uh, plays into the hands of working class and middle class communities when they use that word ideas because we kind of got them in a verbal checkmate when we say yes thank you so much for decades of ideas in my lifetime in my parents lifetime what we need is not more ideas we need more we ideas now what do I mean when I say we need more we ideas well we need policy platform strategy that starts from the bottom up instead of the top down. So when you have a community that there is extreme poverty uh, anywhere in the world, not just South America or North America, you can solve the people. And this is exactly why some of these uh, political leaders in South America that are so uh, vilified in the American media here are so beloved in South America because they actually go to communities where there's the most highest levels of poverty and they talk to the people in community meetings that are thorough dialogues of what do they want for their communities to improve education, health care, infrastructure, housing, uh, human services, etc. Uh, fairer elections, which is not what uh, the United States government has a great strength in promoting in, in South America in our lifetimes and our parents and grandparents lifetimes so we need more we ideas and that's why when you watch a commercial uh, news program or a newspaper read the commercial newspaper in America and you say how could Hugo Chavez or how could Evo Morales be so unpopular well that's exactly the point you know there wouldn't be any more corporate media necessary <laughs> for the uh, public to waste our time on if you actually had policies across the board in every country that actually engaged the citizenry in participation in a way that it wasn't just serving as a prop at election time and then everybody go back to consuming and watching television and stay out of the dialogue. Um, I have this really vivid memory that I don't know if this is an unfair comparison or not, but I'll give you a picture from my life that was very emotional. When I was a freshman, I had just come back from Northern Europe where my dad had a job. He used to work at Fermi Lab here in the United States, and he worked for CERN and uh, DAISY in Europe. So, you know, the first year I was back, I was a freshman in this high school, and I felt very American on the inside, but on the outside it showed that I was not an American-American. You know, I wasn't the real American. If you ever hear Trump's speeches, he talks about the real American. I know what that feels like to be put in those shoes by others who don't know anything about me, but they say in one second, yeah, that's not a real American. And uh, one of the people that did this, uh, I was a soccer player in high school, so I guess in the 1980s that wasn't quite the cool thing to be. But this football player really, really thought he had me sussed up uh, within, you know, 30 seconds of seeing me one day and he walked up over to me and you know the name calling started immediately because you can always when you're a football player call a soccer player a soccer player and that's hilarious to at least 25 other football players at the lunch table in a high school which you know I can take it I got tough skin you know uh, but it was emotionally kind of a, a learning experience of how uh, there's a pecking order in America and it starts real early if you have a lot of ideas 
prioritized and not we do this. Uh, so he, he took my french fries, and if you knew me in high school, french fries was a pretty big deal to me. I really liked french fries. <laughs> and so every day they would go through this routine where I would see if that guy was in school that day, because he was going to make it eventually over in that lunch uh, hour to my table and take my french fries and call me a soccer player. And, you know, one of these weeks, I don't know what happened in me. You know, I guess I realized that I don't have to listen to the ideas rule makers. I listened to the weediest rule makers, and I told him to stop taking my french fries. And he looked at his other football players <coughs> and laughed. It was funny. And kept on doing it. So every day, you know, eventually uh, I got the, the courage one day to, to say, I'm not going to tell him to stop taking my french fries. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to get him in a headlock which is not a smart thing to do because he's got at least 25 of his other buddies. And I hit him in the head at least once. Quickly, the monitor guy from the lunchroom took me and him to the office, and we were given both a three-day suspension. Um, it just brings to mind, and that's my time, when uh, Hugo Chavez was uh, interviewed in 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Change uh, Talks, and somebody from a, a news outlet, maybe it was American, I don't remember, said, you know, how do we get more policies that are based on everyday working class communities? And Hugo Chavez looked right at the camera and said, you do what we did. Ooh. Ooh. Hey, your pen. Uh. Hey, hey, Jonathan, your pen. Jonathan, your pen. That's okay. Uh, Next speaker. Oh, boy, Jonathan. Next speaker. My fellow Americans. You going to go? All right, I'll go. I'll go. All right, all right. Peter, Peter where's Peter at? LA brother. Oh, there he is. Right up front. Beautiful, man. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, my mom wants to go to Argentina, so that's why I'm here tonight, man. What an eye opener. Very exciting experience. The mate looks good. She's a tea drinker too. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing that with her. A little mate. I think we don't know how worse off we are here and sometimes better off we are here in certain respects until we get out of here. Yeah. You just got to go and see what do Asians do that I could learn from and make things better. Yeah. What, and you always find one or two things that we haven't even conceived of yet. Yeah. P P Peter makes a great point about when you travel, foreign travel, is to see these different to see these things that we do every day yeah. here and just experience it every day over there. So so the bathroom thing is, is a big one. I love it. I love going to the bathrooms. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a real big thing. Um, movie theaters, I love to go to the movie theaters. In America, oh, yeah. we don't have reserved seats, but the rest of the world, you, gotta, you have a reserved seat in a movie theater. Um, the metro system, I love going on everybody's metro system, or, or the subway, and uh, yeah. I find the rest of the world, I'm shocked because, uh, you know, live in a bubble, but I'm shocked that the rest of the world, a lot of these countries actually have good subway systems, excellent subway systems, and timely. I mean, they come very often, and are always crowded, too. Um, uh. the, the exchange of money is interesting. We just came back from Romania. Romania is, uh, to get from the airport, it's like, uh, like it was about $7. $7 to go about 12 miles. And, and it's, like, it's like nothing to us. But to them, uh, you know, $7 is a great deal. So that's the other thing to learn, to match up. How much does their milk cost, you know, in, in their dollars? Life. Quality of life. Quality of life, yes, it's an excellent, excellent uh, um, a measurement to look at. Um, courtesies, my mom noticed in Romania, people don't look at you and they don't use the word excuse me. Like in America, we say excuse me or sorry. In Romania, they don't look at you and they just walk by you, you know. Just squeeze by you. So my mom noticed it. That was kind of cool. She noticed it. But uh, so there's different, different kind of um, uh, social, social things. And then uh, Frank mentioned about pollution. Uh, certain countries are dirty, naturally dirty. Um, you know, you mentioned China. Um, 
this comes from, this comes from our our government, man. Our government teaching us, we uh, schmuckos, <laughs> why we should have clean water. Why we shouldn't throw plastic in the water. Yeah. Or garbage um, out the oh. car window. Or garbage out the car window, because that garbage out the car window is going to find its way into the water. I'm proud of that. We, we don't do it. Yeah. For one generation, we learned not to throw gum wrappers out the window or yeah. pack of cigarettes out the back. Yeah. It, 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 public schools said we don't do that. That's, yeah. that's a no no. And it Smoke, worked. Smokey the Bear. Smokey the Bear taught us about all that too. 30 years it worked. Yeah, yeah. So it's very important that the government and uh, someone, someone asked a question about um, why is uh, South America or other countries uh, uh, have a lower standard of living than, than, than we do? And we're only 200 years old? It, it it's yeah it's be it's sometimes it's perception, but a lot of times it's because of dictatorships and these dictatorships, wow. they crush people, and they cut off the supply right it's money. These countries are wealthy countries. Venezuela is a wealthy country, man. They got oil. They're the fourth, or the fourth largest provider of oil throughout the throughout the world, but yet they have these long lines to buy bread, long lines to buy tires, just to get a, you know, if you, have, if you need new tires. I mean, this is the reason we're having a revolution, because Maduro's holding on to all that money and siphoning off all this, all these products from coming into the country. So it's all about leadership at the top. Uh, so that's spot. why leadership in any country is very important. Yes, yes, what, what? And our president isn't even showing his tax return, much less uh, a gesture that I'm with you, I'm like you, you know, I have nothing to hide. What's with that? I mean, that's, that's low. That's, I don't think that's ever happened before. No. 1913 is when we started having income taxes in America. All right. So All right. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret again. Yeah, go ahead, Margaret. Margaret. Oh, Margaret's got more. Margaret. 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 Really big pluses and minuses. One of her pluses was is that she built maternity hospitals for women there, and she instituted maternity leave. Now in Argentina, oh. I was very frustrated when I went with my with my newborn there to um, our son to uh, introduce him to his grandparents, and found out in in, in this country I had. Uh, six weeks of unpaid maternity leave, and in Argentina they have two years of paid maternity leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so I thought, well, she, anyway, uh, she, um, but she also had some serious minuses in that um, if you crossed her, you were definitely not not long for this world. Yeah. Hyperinflation, when we went there, in fact, all the times that we went there, if you sold property, you sold it for American dollars. If you bought property, you had to have American dollars. You couldn't buy it with Argentine currency, even when the, even when the economy was stable and there wasn't hyperinflation. We went there for our honeymoon. We went and the, the at that time it was called the Ostran, and it was uh, it's since been changed to the peso, but you had four astrales per dollar, and by the time we went left, it was 30 astrales per dollar, and people um, were posting their prices in the windows on a daily basis, and you didn't it wasn't in the window. You had to go in, and the and the shop clerk had a, a list that she kept of what the actual prices were. And it changed, obviously, on a daily basis. And this was for everything, pencils and, and everything else. Um, OK. Our uh, brother-in-law said that they, they bought an apartment. And the people 
bought apartments a lot. Middle class people bought apartments a lot. And what they paid for their apartment 10 years before, you paid for a chicken at that time. So a, that was what the inflation worked out to be. It was really very devastating there. So the other thing I just wanted to make, oh, she left, <laughs> about Haiti. Haiti uh, was, of course, under a dictatorship of the Duvaliers for, for decades. And they were supported by um, they were supported by the U.S. government, and they were also supported by Mother Teresa. For all of those who think that Mother Teresa was a saint, she was a real supporter of the Duvalier family. And she went there, and they hugged her, and she kissed them, and all that jazz. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> all right, Margaret. Mike. In the days of Slim Brothers, they'd have a whole house full of people waiting to get on that open mic. <laughs> Who wants ten, to say something? Ten people. Yeah. Ten come people. on. Ten come people. on. Charlie, Do come I on. Okay, Slim Brothers' ghost is rolling over in his grave Revolution. right now. We know that guarantee. Come on. Revolution. <laughs> Revolution. Say something. All right. Uh-oh, here comes Charlie. Uh, he's coming. <laughs> uh, All right, let's take our speaker. Uh, travel yeah. broadens the mind, I guess someone said. Uh, and you learn about other countries, other cultures. Um, I actually I was thinking about it. I don't know why, but I planned a trip to Canada a number of years ago. But I I actually bought an encyclopedia of Canada and read it uh, before I went and even learned French. <laughs> but it, uh, I don't expect everyone to go to that extent on trips and travels around uh, the world. The, um, the only thing I'll talk about tonight is the two things. Um, Yes, railroads um, came up with the idea of a package uh, transfer. It's called the Railway Express Agency. Uh, some of you may remember they were triangular um, uh, symbols, R-E-A, and they had all green trucks, dark green trucks. Um, their trucks operated out of what is now the Dearborn South. If you go along Canal Street, um, that whole block there from, is it Harrison? Not Harrison, but um, the other street south. The Van Buren? Yeah. Roosevelt. No, no, well, for the Sorry. other one. The one where the station is. Um, that that whole block there uh, were REA Express truck depot, and I used to ride the the the, train, the bus there, went past there, so I'd see that. Um, Amtrak had a thing of putting on a box car in the back of trains for a while. I actually went through lectures when they introduced this thing. They were going to have express service. Again, um, for various reasons, it doesn't work. Uh, you have to, that one ran into all sorts of problems, switching boxcars on and off trains, and you have to have personnel to do this. And they ran into it and finally just gave up on it altogether. Uh, passenger trains don't make money simply carrying passengers. They have, they used to, that's why your station agents, actually people don't realize this, station agents actually were kind of like made their own money by charging for the packages and things like that. They were independent type of employers. They weren't really employees of the railroad and made money. I was in, in, in the same in every railroad. But they actually made money on their own by putting packages on and taking them off 
and they would charge you a certain amount. That's how the station agent earns their income. Now it worked when you have station agents, there were 10,000 stations in the United States. Today there are about 500 and the current administration has its plans that will go down to about 232 railroad stations. So it's a little hard. You could say have express service, but it would have to be very limited. So they have looked at it. I used to, there was another thing too, UPS. I used to think about this many years ago. Um, because my friends are in the, very big in the organized labor movement uh, with UPS. But I used to, many of you may not be aware of this, but UPS, you didn't ship everywhere in the United States and you had to look up certain zip codes. Uh, I just thought that was kind of crummy. They kind of like dumped yeah. the unprofitable marketing right. onto the United States Postal Service. Now the parcel post, uh, the post office is coming in, but um, the railroads until about 1960 made passenger trains, made money in three ways. They, they ticket, ticketed passengers, the packaging, and the U.S. mail, and they lost the packages, and the uh, mail uh, went to other means. So that pretty much brought an end to the uh, passenger network in the United States, and that's why they developed Amtrak and things like this. Regarding uh, the South American countries, the only thing I can say is I believe, and I'm not an expert on this, that the so-called illegal immigrants to the United States are coming primarily from Latin American countries, and I don't know about South America. They're not coming from Mexico or other countries. Now, I believe that's because perhaps the standard of living in Mexico has gotten better. I know that from Eastern Europeans are not coming to the United States to the extent that they used to, um, that I'm aware of, because the standard of living in those countries has gotten better. So there isn't quite the incentive for people to make such uh, severe gestures. Um, but that's been declining. But. Um, I certainly hope the situation will reverse itself because um, this, uh, I, I believe they're the ones that are really going to suffer um, by this alleged restrictions on immigration. Uh, and they probably have the greatest incentive for doing so. If they indigenously can change the situation in those countries, it would be wonderful. But anyhow, thank you for uh, Very nice and interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Alright, what do you got to say? <laughs> you look like you look like one of them cowboys. Uh, almost nothing. Oh gosh. <laughs> or the riders of the storm. Uh, I, I should have made some notes before facing the microphone. So in case I go well uh <laughs> I sort of uh, was impressed by uh, the speaker giving a good anti-smoking commercial. Really, we don't have that many here, so thanks for bringing us yeah, a good one. It's the government idea <laughs> that did it. The private sector is not going to do that on their pro package. Just one more way, central government changes hearts and minds. Yeah. Did you hear that? One more way, it's central like government Russia. changes attitudes, like Margaret said. Yeah. Well, <laughs> about about something else. There was a lot of superficial uh, about thing about uh, Latin America here. Uh, you know, it's so easy for us to make the uh, conclusions about Latin America sitting from a cushy seat that you are sitting on now. Yeah. But it's a different story when you really look into the beginnings of those countries and uh, 
you will understand why are they so poor, so backward, etc., etc., and why are they trying to get here. You know, Miranda tried to, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, he tried to organize the state. Oh, by the way, uh, can you turn that off? Oh, you don't want to be on it? Yeah. I think you're being sincere. Beautiful. Uh, I'm camera shy. Would you turn it off? Okay. Furthermore, I'm not photogenic either. Oh, yeah. Um, I thought you were referring to the music that came all of a sudden. Yeah, the romantic. Come on, give us a dance. Dance up there, brother. Don't cry for me, Argentina. There you go. Yeah, right. Well, but, you uh, lived in, you grew up in, tell us, you get your background. <laughs> You're not explained. I'm not a capitalist. He's from South America. I'm not a capitalist. <laughs> yeah, to me. <laughs> Well, well, anyways, you know, Miranda you tried up, to order. Well, tell, tell the people, where did you grow up and where? Venezuela? I'm not a capitalist. Oh, I know that. <laughs> don't have to marry a socialist. That's what you always tell us. I'm not a capitalist. He never says who he is. <laughs> I just go ahead and ignore them. Who are you? <laughs> well, anyways, you know, Latin America's got a little room. Uh, very uh, weird history uh, to begin with. They, Miranda tried to organize them into United States type of country from from Mexico to Argentina and he failed. The reason he f failed is because they already had an ingrained already with long roots of oligarchs in each country. Yeah. And they, are, they persist to this day in controlling the, controlling the wealth of the country and the political power. They will not rest unless they do that. And they usually do with our help. Whenever you have a, you hear in this so-called free press, there is a revolution in Mexico, there is a revolution in El Salvador, there is a revolution in Guatemala. Does your free press gives you the details? Why are they fighting? No. What's it all about? I don't know. And if unless you know, you don't know what's going on there. We, for instance, just as an example, why did we side with the government in, in, during the revolution in El Salvador? Why? Uh, Boy, anybody? Sandinistas. You got a free press, people. You got a free yeah. press. Sandinistas. Sandinistas. Uh, that was in Nicaragua. Oh. Or in Guatemala, oh. for that matter. Oh, the bananas. They have fruit. United it is in fruit. our interest. United Fruit Company, we wanted their side. That's a good example, United Fruit Companies. They're the ones that call Washington and say, hey, yes. they elected some guy here that favors the poor. It's not in our interest. The Marines come in, and we get a nice right-wing dictatorship. And yeah. that's our stamp through Latin America, right-wing dictatorship. Yeah. And so the, the, while the power is really in a few families, like in Honduras, it's a hundred families. That consists the oligarch. That consists the military, economic, and political power. You know, when they deposed Peron, for example, I thought, wow, they got rid of a right-wing dictator. That was the only dictator that I was wrong about because actually Evita and Peron, they favored the masses. Yeah. They actually favored the, the poor and, and the majority. The and supposedly you get democracy run by the majority. Not in Latin America, it's a joke. It's, it, even in here it's a joke in a way because we have this electoral college, even though I wasn't for her, she won 
the public vote, but the electoral college said no. So there is a question mark where there is a major run by uh, democracy is run by a majority, isn't it? Right. And a good example, you know, there is just an underlying grievance under it all in almost every country in Latin America. Let's take an example like the Mexican Revolution. Why did the Mexican Revolution take place? You all are educated people. Against the French. Huh? <laughs> Against the French. The Spaniards. The Spaniards. Spaniards. The French. 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 Then the Spaniards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the new landlords kept switching. Then the peasants took the land. New landlords, huh? New. Is that the reason for the revolution? In yeah. a sense, it is. Peasants. In every, practically Did every, else want to give a rebuttal? every revolution. <laughs> Last chance. Okay. Go on. Go on, Ed. We're listening. I saw Making sure. There is one after me. I'll give there might be. Pause. We never know. <laughs> well, anyways. Uh, Mexican Revolution took place, and it was a big failure. Why was it a big failure? Come on, you know, the all these government. geniuses in here, the <laughs> top of the line in college complex, real brains. Come on now. Uh, remember, we are human, all fucking humans. <laughs> <laughs> so give us the answer. Come that's, on. A, that's a good an answer, city. But anyways, <laughs> the Mexican Revolution, it's, it's, it's typical of what's lying underneath in every Latin American country, whether you like it whether you want to admit it, but you will not hear it in the free press of the U.S. When, when the oligarchs thought that, hey, it's about time we, we, we change our chief of police, which is the right-wing dictator, Porfirio Diaz, I believe it was. Yeah, I think. And, you know, by doing so, they weakened his security apparatus. And in any country, if you can weaken the security apparatus, those people that have been so unjustly sent into poverty for hundreds of years, their descendants in this case, they will tend to rise. And so this is what happened. The people that lost their land and in Latin America, they would say, the, the oligarch will tell the peasant, you're gonna give up your land por la buena or por la mala. You know what that means? For good or for bad? You either give it either the, <coughs> the good way or the bad way. <laughs> and this kind of grievance is, is is actually right underneath and is simmering. That's what happened in Guatemala when they elected this and he thought that he, the first thing, if you read, it's land reform. Yeah. And that's a no-no for a gringo that is not in our favor. That is in favor of the majority of the poor and who cares? We need the resources from those countries. And that's where it lies. If you, you were traveling, you go to a Latin American country and you, will, you just go deeper under the surface, under that, that flashy motel you were staying in. And visit those barrios and see how those people look. And they are the majority. When Chavez was coming into power, 86% power team there was in Venezuela, 86%. I mean, at, at what percent is a revolution justified? At what percent? 70? 75. 90? Okay. Come on now. You know, there is such inequality and such injustice in Latin America that it's been simmering for hundreds of years. And once in a while, it comes to the surface and we, we take sides and we try to keep the state of quo because it's in our interest. They are helpless countries. They are not united. If they had united just like the US united, 
they wouldn't be exploited so easily. But almost any big power in, in the world can take advantage of them. The only thing that they can do is just deal with the oligarchs. Forget about parliament and freely elected thing. The oligarchs got the control and we can get a good price for the minerals and the oils and all that. And if they try to come up with industry, man, we, we will squash them. We will we'll flood them with uh, cheap uh, articles that they try to sell. And uh, after they go under, we just raise the price to whatever we want to, to high have. And that's the one. Going back to the Mexican Revolution, OK? So Pancho Villa took power in the north. Zapatas took power in the south, and they did actually address the grievances of land reform. And they, they, they did return some of the land back to their owners. But the revolution was a failure. Why was it a failure? Well, for one thing, I think Pancho Villa and Zapata, they thought that they would. He's not done with they, that. They had a new. He wants to show a video at the end. Well, elected official, I don't recall his name, and uh, they, they trusted it. And so they, through wheels and deals, both of them were ambushed and executed through ambushes. And the land came, went back to the original phony owners, and no justice was done. What year was that? What year, approximately? 1910 to 1915. So, you, you know, when Chavez came on, I said, this is the biggest joke in history. He, he thinks he's going to change all that through the ballot. You know, the ballot works good when it's, when it's just, but it's manipulated. And the only time, the only reason he won was because good old Carter administration or Carter Center was there to observe the elections. He wouldn't have no chance to it. And the first thing they did after they elected, they got the whiskey muffle, remember, on the helicopter? And only when the poor from all around Caracas, inundated Caracas, immobilized it, they finally returned him. And did, did they say, did our newspaper publish who actually abducted him? Not a word. Do you know anybody who knows? Five, ten. So, you know, I, 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 from that moment on, I said, this guy is not going to survive because the oligarchs are not going to give up just like that, the power. There is no way. And so the second thing, they, really they uh, to speak boycott, the they sabotage the production of petroleum. And by some miracle, a big oligarch actually helped him to get some help from India, experts, and kept the, the oil producing. Otherwise, they would have the economy what's going on now. And what's going on now, that's their plan. Don't think that it is just by chance that it happened. They, in here we say it's mismanagement. <laughs> Man, what a joke. Well, right. I could have go on and on right. and on. Yeah. 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 That's the after party is for. This is just the first five minutes of the bottle. The after party can go on for four hours, and I'll be there to listen to it. Very enjoyable. Uh, thank you. Well, you know, there were two surprises. Yeah, cool. and you, you can oh tell. My gosh. You can tell I used to be an uh, elementary uh, teacher. Uh, but here's an example of, this is what we would do in, on some American machine. We'd turn this out in five seconds, we'd wrap it, and it would be enameled. And that would be a hanger. So, then I find this guy trying to make a living with three sticks, and he, he's got a staple gun. I got to give him credit for being in, <laughs> in, in, ingenuitous. And so he's slitting and break, you know, he slits the whatever it's called, the, uh, there's a word for that in mortise and tenon. Mortise and tenon. And then 
he somehow he uh, gets this to go through the top without splitting this thing, this, this wood. Now it's taking him about 20 minutes. And, and I said, oh, for God's sake, you know, can I take one of these home because they look like antiques. This is probably the way my grandfather made a hanger <laughs> in the 1890s. So he had the, he had the premium model and the uh, glued model. And I thought, today people still make hangers. I take for granted that this you just turn out somehow, and uh, I don't have no idea how, but I know it's one-tenth of the time that this guy took to make a wooden hanger. So that, in some way it breaks my heart, but somebody still handcrafts something. I hope he gets some kind of decent living from it. Uh, it's good to end with music, though. Let's be upbeat. Let's be a beat because I didn't play for you the tango. And I'd like to do that. The bottom right corner. Click on the bottom right corner of the screen. All the way to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Full screen. Somebody's got to help Paul pull it up. Yeah. Oh, you put the microphone close to the speaker on the... So... Is that the tango? Is that the tango? Oh, wow, that was the tango and... Uh, <laughs> It's very Lucky seductive. You stuck me there because I didn't want you to reveal that I was one of the guys. Oh, you were one of the guys. Oh. <laughs> now I can blackmail you. Uh, it's you, Frank, right there. He's very seductive, uh, athletic, limber, limber, and uh, they kind of want each other, but they don't. You know, they're looking away, but. The man's feet are always on the floor and the woman's tossed around and she's lifting her feet all over and the man is smoothly delivering her to... That's athletic. Wow. All right. So I'll leave you with that. Okay. Let's go. Pop. That was Pop. very good. Pop. Very good. Man. Okay. We took a journey. Keep traveling. Thank you, Peter. Enjoy. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Thank you. Thank you.